So this is the first breakout session of the Women's Conference. I'm Tiffany Bath. Uh, make sure you're in the right room. This is Strength in the Middle of Weakness. Um, and let's just say at the beginning, like I'm sure, uh, chit-chatted with a lot of the other speakers and we're all like, I don't know why we're talking on this because we do not have this thing. You know, this is not something where we have arrived. So for sure, this is something that um, I need to be a student of this lesson as well. And, and God's faithful to um, when you study something that, you know, you probably get more out of it than anyone else ends up doing. So, all right. <clears throat> well, my doctor liked to say, quote, Tiffany, you've got a uterus that likes to practice. <laughs> so uh, I thought that was funny. With every pregnancy that I had, um, I had Braxton Hicks um, with some of them starting as early as three months. And so at this point in my story, I had had um, three babies already, three cesareans, and I was almost eight months pregnant with our fourth child. Um, a lot of those contractions were just coming, and we decided we probably should go ahead and go to the hospital. So when we got there, our young doctor seemed to be giving us the choice about what we wanted to do. She said, you can let me go ahead and deliver um, this almost 36-week-old baby whose lungs had been tested and they weren't ready. Or, Billy, you can go ahead and take your wife home. She's had three cesareans already, and if she keeps having all these contractions, um, while you're at home, her uterus could rip, and the baby would die instantly. And if you don't get Tiff back to the hospital, then she'll die. So y'all let me know. <laughs> well, by the time that we had gone to the hospital with all these contractions, we hadn't slept, so we we're totally exhausted, um, conflicted. We're not sure. These seem like two horrible choices before us. So this is 2003. Uh, one of us said, let's call the church and just ask them to pray for us. And what felt like a few minutes later, the entire pastoral staff from Lakeview was in my hospital room. So Billy kind of just lays out all the details and I'll never forget, Pastor Keith was standing there, and when he finished, he looked at us and he said, well, it looks like we're having a baby today. And we were like, well, of course, yes, thank you, Lord. You know, we, we, we just couldn't see through, through all of that to try to make that decision. Um, and a funny note, of course, I'm not supposed to have this baby for, for another month or so. So I had brought to the hospital my list of names. You know, we had a bunch that we were considering. So Pastor Peter had grabbed my list and he looked at it and he said, you don't even need to think anymore. No discussion. I see the name Jonathan on here. It's a done deal. I didn't know if I was having a boy or a girl. This is going to be Jonathan right here. And so I had to laugh, but a few minutes, not minutes, hours, a few hours later, Preemie Jonathan Michael Bath was born, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't good. Um, his lungs hadn't developed. Like they said, they were full of fluid and he was struggling. They had um, to rush him off to the NICU. And um, I remember the first time that I got to see him, you know, I had had cesarean number four and they, you know, did all that. And they finally let me go into the room and I just remember um, staring at him with all the tubes and the monitors. And every time that he took a breath, his entire chest would cave in. And he was, you know, skinny. And, and I just looked at the nurse and I said, how long can a little body do that? You know, it just seemed like it, it, it like, gosh, an hour later, you'd have to just be exhausted. Um, but not to worry, they told me, um, this isn't that unusual. Usually, you know, between 24 hours, the body will absorb that fluid. You know, it's probably going to be all okay. But it wasn't. Um, not with, with my boo. Now, that's his nickname to this day. He is a full-time uh, full Marine, but he's my boo. That's my boo. So... Um, as a matter of fact, day three in the NICU, he actually took a turn for the worse. And uh, the doctor came into my hospital room, and all he could do was shake his head. And he said, it just doesn't make sense. I, I don't know, Tiffany. 
I was a picture of weakness. I probably never felt weaker in my life. At that point, I really, I had been walking with the Lord for over a decade. I was a woman that, I was in the word. I was a woman of prayer. Um, but that's not what I looked like that day. I was overcome with circumstances, with worry. This trial loomed bigger than life. And everything fell under its shadow, including my thoughts about God, at least for a little while. While I was preparing this breakout session, I came across an article by John Piper, which was written probably before some of you guys were born in this room. I was born, but I wasn't married to Billy yet, and that's been 30 years. Um, I call him Vintage Piper. So this is from Vintage Piper. Uh, his article's entitled, Christ's Power is Made Perfect in Weakness. He said, we had a really good all-church strategy meeting. One of the songs we sang has a chorus that goes like this. I'm not a singer, so you're not getting it sang to you. Since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy or my soul, like the sea billows roll, since Jesus came into my heart. He said, as we sang it, I, wonder how, I wondered how everyone in the chapel was processing that statement in the light of real life experience when sea billows of joy do not roll over the soul. Here's how I fitted my own experience, he said. Yes, since knowing Jesus, joy has rolled over me like the waves of the sea, but not always. There are times when the tide goes out, God is still God, joy is still joy, but I'm baking in the seaweed on the beach waiting for the tide to come in. And I thought, thank you, John Piper. That's just practical. I mean, that's our, the reality of living here on the earth. And that's where I was July 2003, sitting in that hospital bed, unable to see through the fog in my mind. Just like Piper says, paraphrase a little bit, um, entering into a, a real life transforming relationship with God, um, it turns our world upside down. There's joy, comfort, a sense of belonging, but not always. When you saw the breakout topic and you chose this one, which is strength, when you're weak, hopefully you're in the right place. We've locked the doors now. You can't leave. So. <laughs> what drew you to pick this session? Are you in a season of needing God's strength? Of course, I mean, is there a season when we really don't need him? But certainly when weakness is highlighted in my life, I find my place, myself in a different place. Um, I see my need a little more clearly. Perhaps you're struggling with what feels like a life full of weakness and feeling defeated by it. I think many of us in this room can relate to that. <clears throat> I am a homeschool mom of 23 years. Um, I'm barely still holding on to that title. My last child, number five, is a senior. senior. Um, we don't t uh, technically have an empty yes nest yet. Gosh, I can't talk. Um, visually, this is what I see. Um, I have my last little birdie. I've got my nest, and he likes to be in perpetual practice flight above the nest. He touches down every now and then a little bit, but he is just chomping at the bit to make this the permanent flight out of the nest. Um, we are so excited for him and terrified and happy and sad and this whole mix uh, we've been trying to prepare for this. You know, we've launched four other ones, but somehow this one does seem um, a little different. And I know we could have a whole thing on this. I know many of you ladies are empty nesters, and I'm sure you have much to teach us about this. But I feel like I guess I'll be a homeschool mom forever. When I had to make this talk, you're getting an outline. This is who I am. I'm a homeschool mom. There are three points. Let's talk about them. We're going to cover what is weakness and where does it come from. Then we're going to explore, are our weaknesses good or bad? Are they a positive or a negative? Do you see them as an asset 
or a liability? And lastly, why are they there? Is there any purpose? Our key biblical text will be 2 Corinthians 12. We'll start in verse 2. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. And I know this man was caught up into paradise. We'll jump to seven. To keep me from being conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being conceited. Three times I pled with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power, and King James uses the word strength, is perfected in weakness. So what is weakness? Um, John Piper says in that same article, Christ's power made perfect, and that's where all my Piper quotes are going to come from today. says, weaknesses are not sins, but they're experiences, situations, circumstances, and wounds that are hard to bear and that we can't remove because either they're beyond our control or because love dictates that we not return evil for evil. So in Piper's definition, so to speak, that he just gave us, he had four words. They were nouns, homeschooling me. They were experiences, situations, circumstances, and wounds. Today we're going to be talking about those kinds of weaknesses in light of the strength that's available to us. Elizabeth Elliot said, it is the experience of weakness that puts us in the position of seeking another's strength, and that strength is God's. Well, we are a room here today full of women who are full of weaknesses. But I think we could all say we know there are times when we feel like we are really in the press and our limitations are enormous and they scream loud in our lives. And I have to ask you the question, do you see those weaknesses as positive or negative? Would you call them good things or bad things? A different way to think about it might be <clears throat> to ask you if you see them as assets or liabilities. I'm back in the workforce after 28 years. I'm now an employee again as an accountant for a company. And God has a sense of humor as I think he put an article from desiringgod.org in my path. John Bloom, the author, is the one who threw out the idea of associating these weaknesses and accounting terms with assets and liabilities. His article entitled, Weakness May Be Your Greatest Strength, he asks, how well are you investing the weaknesses that you've been given? Perhaps nobody's ever asked you that question before. Maybe it sounds nonsensical. After all, people invest assets in order to increase their value. They don't invest liabilities. They try to eliminate or minimize or even cover up liabilities. It's easy for us to see our strengths as assets, but most of us naturally consider our weaknesses as liabilities, deficiencies to minimize. But God in his providence, gives us our weaknesses just as he gives us our strengths. In God's economy, where the return on investment that he values the most is faith working through love from Galatians, weaknesses become assets. We can even call them talents, he says, to be stewarded and invested. It may even be that the most valuable asset God has given you to steward is not a strength, but a weakness. That was challenging. I, I don't think that we think about our weaknesses that way. Um, I certainly don't think of them as assets, and I'm all about trying to cover them up in my life. I'm not about putting them on display. Um, and that's what I was busy doing on Jonathan's third day in the NICU when his pediatrician came to my hospital room. I had just returned from visiting Boo Down in the NICU. I just was allowed these little short visits. I couldn't hold him, and they didn't even want me to touch him and stimulate him at all. 
So his pediatrician didn't know that Jonathan had been born prematurely and that his health was declining, and so he had come to check on me. As far as we knew, my doctor wasn't a believer, um, but he had walked with our family. This was, you know, kid number four for years, and he knew that we were people of faith, or he thought that we were. He did not find a faith-filled woman sitting in front of him that day. He began to talk to me unaware of what he was even saying as God used him to remind me in that moment that I had a relationship with God that I could turn to. God wouldn't leave me there, lost in this fog, wandering without direction, feeling desperately alone. This trial was tailor-made for Tiffany Bath at this specific time in my walk with God. It certainly was encompassing all of my weaknesses, but it was designed by a loving God, my loving Savior, for a purpose, and it was designed for my good. In a book written by J.I. Packer entitled Weakness is the Way, Packer says, Christian faith, prompting solid hope and promising present help, should dispel all fears and expectations but it does not always do so. The truth is that in many respects, certainly in spiritual matters, we are all weak and inadequate, and we need to face it. We need to be aware of our limitations and to let this awareness work in us humility and self-distrust and a realization of our helplessness on our own. Thus, we may learn, and he's going to tell us three things we need to learn, our need to depend on Christ, our Savior and Lord, at every turn of the road, to practice that dependence as one of the constant habits of our heart, and thereby to discover what Paul discovered before us, what he said in 2 Corinthians 12, 10, that when I am weak, then I am strong. When I thought about Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, conveying his feelings about his situation, I realized I was in pretty good company. You know, Paul wasn't reveling in his weaknesses either. He was pleading to God, right? Take this away. He pleaded a lot. He pleaded a bunch of times, right? But then something happened. When God told Paul that his strength is perfected in weakness, we see Paul's response in the second part of verse 9. He says, well, most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Paul saw purpose and the heart of God tied directly to his weakness, as counterintuitive as that may seem when we first read it. John Bloom says, Paul completely reframes the way Christians are to view weakness even deeply painful ones that can appear to hinder our calling and the powers of darkness that seek to exploit. What at first seems to us like an expensive liability turns out to be a valuable, God-given asset. Someday when our master returns, he'll ask us to give an account of the talents he's entrusted to us. Some of those talents will be your weaknesses. We don't want to tell him that we buried any of them. It may even be that the most valuable talent in our investment portfolio turns out to be a weakness. It's really such a comforting way to look at our lives this way. Piper said, God's design is to make you a showcase for Jesus's power but not necessarily the way the market demands, not by getting rid of all of our weaknesses, but by giving strength to endure and even rejoice in tribulation. Let God be God. If he wills to show the perfection of his son's power in our weakness, instead of by our escaping the weakness, he knows best. Trust him. I hope That just like the spirit of the Lord helped me, even if it was just baby steps, to see that my weaknesses are assets when they're in the hands of the Lord, that you too can think 
of these seemingly negative parts of you in a different light. So let's look at our last question. Why? Why are these weaknesses in us? Do they serve any purpose in our lives? In 2 Corinthians 12.10, Paul says, For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. All right, he has a few more things to be content with than just weakness. He threw in there insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. Um, That's a lot. I'm just trying to join Paul with the first one. So we're going to stick to, for the sake of Christ, I'm content with weaknesses today. But can I say that with Paul, that I am content with them? Paul had unveiled the key truth, the last part of those three things that Packer said. He said, we need to learn with Paul, for when I am weak, I'm strong. I think it's easier to embrace some contentment with this idea when we can focus on purpose for it. So let's go to Piper again. I know I quote a lot of Piper. I was going to try to paraphrase this, but my goodness, this was just too good. So Piper, he's going to lay out this beautiful purpose for us. He said, the ultimate purpose of God in our weakness is to glorify the kind of power that moved Christ to the cross and kept him there until the work of love was done. Paul said that Christ crucified was foolishness to the Jews, a stumbling block to the, I mean, to the Greeks, stumbling block to the Jews, but to those who were called, it's the power of God and the wisdom of God. The deepest need that you and I have in weakness, Piper says, in adversity is not quick relief, but the well-grounded confidence that what's happening to us is part of the greatest purpose of God in the universe, the glorification of the grace and power of his son, that same grace and power that sent him to the cross and kept him there till the work of love was done. That is what God is building in our lives That's the meaning of weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecution, and calamity. Bloom says, that's the surprising value of our weaknesses. They manifest God's power in us in ways that our strengths don't. That's what Jesus meant when he said to Paul, my power is made perfect in weakness. Our weaknesses are indispensable because God manifests the fullness of his power through those weaknesses. So the purpose, God goes on display. His power is seen. We're weak, but he's strong through us, and he receives all the glory. Yes, I see my weaknesses, and it can be overwhelming, but I'm not left there in my inadequacies. It thrusts me into the arms of the one who is adequate, the one who does have power and strength. It builds my faith as I take the concerns uh, that weigh in my mind or the people or the problems and I put them into the hands of the Lord and then I look for him to be the fixer or the solution bringer as opposed to trying to be that myself. Parents, you hearing me? Wives, you hear me? Tiffany, are you hearing this? When I wrote this message, I needed that message all the more for the things going on in my household right now. Not like I couldn't be reminded 24 seven, but I'm not the fixer of the people God's put in my life. My, my coworkers, my friends, my children, I'm not the fixer of my husband. Oh, I pray that God's power and strength in their lives would be bigger to me than whatever I think when I try to use my own power to change and a lot of times to manipulate change. Forgive me, Lord. His strength is made perfect that we're completed, entirely accomplished in my weakness. Another way that God uses our weakness is to build compassion for the people around us. It's easy to be pretty haughty 
when you don't struggle with a particular weakness. If it comes easy to us and we have some natural abilities to accomplish the things that, that need to be done, uh, we can translate that attitude to other people. Just do it. Do it like I do it. It's so easy, right? Uh, by the way, we can kind of become experts at stealing God's glory in those categories. Um, why do I have those natural abilities? Um, did they not come with this package that God gave me, right? Uh, maybe I work on honing them a little bit, right? But God put me together, and he deposited those strengths in me that I might be quick to commend myself for. Um, no ability to boast on our part. But, okay, what about when we're not talking about my strengths? What if we're talking about my weaknesses? Now I'm not so haughty, right? Now I'm interacting differently with those around me. I need grace, right? I need mercy because I, I'm weak in that category. Maybe things aren't coming naturally, and I just can't do it like you can do it. God has used the weak parts of me to remind me that he fashioned me with both. I have strengths and weaknesses. And maybe my friends or my kids or my husband has an opposite list than I do. He builds compassion in me as I interact with those who have different struggles. The one that I'm seeing over there in them, that may not be one that I have, but I have my own list and I know the struggle all too well. It helps me fulfill Ephesians 4.32, which admonishes me to be kind and compassionate, forgiving each other, just as Christ God has forgiven us. If I didn't have those weaknesses in my life, I just wouldn't be the same. And I believe that's one of the purposes behind depositing these assets called weaknesses in us the same way that he gives us our strengths. I love the way that John Bloom uh, summarized the purpose. I have it at the bottom of your notes there. I made it fill in the blank. So you'd have to write the really, really important words. So here we go. Weakness has the tendency to increase our conscious dependence on God, which glorifies him, strengthens our faith, and manifests his power in ways that our strengths never do. I'll say that again. Weakness has the tendency to increase our conscious dependence on God, which glorifies him. It strengthens our faith, and it manifests his power in ways that our strengths never do. Well, it's been almost 20 years since I gave birth to Jonathan and walked those scary first days of his life out. After my pediatrician had been used by God to remind me about the God I was always talking to him about, I'd love to say that I ran to the Lord full of repentance and faith, but I did not. The doctor left that day, and I sat in that hospital room just as overwhelmed as I had been before he had gotten there. Hours passed, and it was the next time for my, my little visit to the NICU to go see Boo. I think it was like 1 or 2 in the morning when I got back to the hospital room, ready to drop in the bed from exhaustion. But God had a different plan. It was at that moment that the spirit of the living God visited me in that room in the middle of the night. I don't know how long this divine appointment lasted, but it felt like it went on for hours. And this experience was all about God and me. Ironically, the subject of a sick baby down the hall never came up during that encounter with God. No, it was about God and it was all about God. In the wee hours of that morning, he showed me a revelation of his glory like I had never seen before. And I hadn't asked for it. I hadn't chased him and begged him. I was going the opposite direction. As the day dawned, my soul had been refreshed. And the despondent, self 
pitying, faithless mom was gone. I had met with my God, and he had shown himself strong in the middle of my weakness. He had settled things in my heart about his character. He had shown me the love that he had for me. He had overwhelmed my heart with affection and acceptance. I knew whose I was at that time. Now I had a testimony written without words on my face as I had new, freshly found faith to face the day. Faith in God himself, not faith in what he was going to do for me. There had been no words of healing that were in that encounter, no promises from the Lord, only words that reminded me of my salvation in the Lord and that the lover of my soul was with me. Well, I thought out logically in my mind that now God was going to give me the opportunity to walk in faith, you know, before the nurses and this pediatrician and everybody who was part of this horrible trial while my son was just declining in the NICU. But in just a short time, the doctor in my room, beaming from ear to ear with delight, my son had unexpectedly taken a turn for the better at some point in the night. It ne had never been about that baby. As the doctor was talking, talking, all I could hear was the Lord saying, did you think anything was too difficult for me? I held the welfare of your son in my hands. This wasn't about a sick baby, Tiffany. It was about God had been faithful to remind, he has been faithful to remind me of this experience time and time again over the years. And praise and glory be to him that many subsequent encounters with weakness as my life unfolded would be different as I saw them in the light of his glory. But I wouldn't be truthful if I said, oh, from that point on, they were just all victories and success, ladies. No. That's one of the things that I love about the Lord. He knows that we are but dust. He knows that I will never shed all of these weaknesses. And as we've learned, that's part of the plan. He's actually orchestrated these weaknesses that we now see as assets. Shake your head. Yes, now we see them as assets in our life. One more quote and then a closing thought. I want to leave you with another thought from J.I. Packer from Weakness and in, in Weakness is the Way. He encourages us, lean on Christ, the lover of your soul, as Paul did. And in all your ongoing weakness, real as it is, you too will be empowered to cope and will be established in comfort and joy. When the world tells us as it does, that everybody has a right to a life that's easy, comfortable, relatively pain-free, a life that enables us to discover, display, deploy all the strengths that are latent within you. The world twists the truth right out of shape. That's not the quality of life which Christ's calling led him. Nor was it Paul's calling, nor is it what we're called to in the 21st century. For all Christians, the likelihood is rather that as our discipleship continues, God will make us increasingly weakness conscious and pain aware so that we may learn with Paul that when we are conscious of being weak, then, and only then, may we become truly strong in the Lord. Should we want it any other way? That was piercing. I just want to end today by letting you ladies know that I have been praying for you for this, this time together. Um, I had a sense that the Lord would draw women in this meeting who are burdened and severely feeling their weaknesses and feeling like you need God in a way that you never have before. 
I want to remind you that the Lord is near and he's working and he has never left your side. If you're overwhelmed by the many, many weaknesses that you look out and you see in your life, remember that those can be some of your greatest assets before the Lord. Accept them. Run to the Lord. He is your refuge and your strength in time of need. He'll help you see what Paul was able to say. When I'm weak, I am strong. Love you, ladies.